Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Dia Vidge, Associate Curator at Creative Time. Before we get started, I want to thank our ASL interpreters, Maria and Deborah, and our captioner, Dalton. To turn your captions on, you can select closed captioning at the bottom of the Zoom window by pressing the CC button. To view the ASL interpreters, look for the ASL screen window and pin it so it's visible throughout the event. Both are offered today in English. I also want to thank the teams at Creative Time and the Verilis Center for making today's program possible and doing so in just a week's time. Um, we respectfully acknowledge that both the Creative Time and Verilis Center offices, where we would gather daily before the pandemic, are on the unceded island of Manahata and Lenape Hoking, the home of the Lenape people who have stewarded this land throughout generations. Beneath the contemporary surface of any site in the United States, there are histories of belonging that have been erased, overlooked, contested, and forgotten, as well as contemporary communities that continue to endure and thrive. As occupiers of this territory, we recognize the continual displacement of Native people. We recognize that our presence on this land is made possible by history of violence and erasure of Indigenous people. We understand that land acknowledgements are often used as an empty stand-in for actual decolonization work and are committed to confronting the ongoing effects of this colonial legacy. In the chat window, you'll see a link to an interactive map where you can search whose lands you are on and learn more about how to be in good relations. We welcome you to add your own land acknowledgement in the chat. This commitment foregrounds today's teaching. We stand firmly in solidarity with the Ukrainian people and condemn the atrocities being committed by Russia. We are committed to politics of decolonization and anti-war globally and recognize Russia's long history of colonial occupation of Ukraine. As we witness the devastation caused by Russia and Ukraine with ripple effects that will that will be and are currently being felt around the world, we decided to organize this teaching, a tried and true rapid response format to bring people together to learn in principled solidarity. The central and complex question for this teaching remains, what does solidarity look like with Ukrainian and oppressed people internationally? We recognize and respect that Ukrainians and Ukrainian artists are currently fighting the Russian invasion and securing their own self-determination, all while trying to survive. For those of us outside of Ukraine, what might the role of artists and art workers be in this struggle? This program is intended to gather our audiences of artists and cultural workers who are mostly located at a distant vantage point to the war to unpack what we've been watching and reading in the news and on social media. This is an introduction to what is happening in Ukraine right now. We hope to also offer some viewpoints into how this war relates to other occupations and struggles globally particularly recognizing the uneven international responses steeped in racism from the media, government actions, and Global North publics. For some, this program will be an entry point, and for others, it'll be very familiar. But we hope that collectively, this is a call to be better informed cultural practitioners in support of meaningful actions for solidarity with ending the war in Ukraine, as well as occupations internationally. In planning this rapid response program, a departure from our typical programming with long lead times, we as organizers made a few critical mistakes that I want to acknowledge. We failed to notify the speakers of the full lineup in advance as confirmations came through simultaneously. This meant that our inclusion of one presentation by two Russian artists involved in the anti-war protests came as a surprise to our Ukrainian guests and some members of the public who were taken aback by the lineup. As a result, the two Russian artists have stepped down in support of calls to see the floor to Ukrainian voices. We take full responsibility for the confusion and the harm caused. We also should have clarified the framing of this program more clearly in our materials and to our speakers. This has already been a humbling learning experience for us, and we will work to be more informed, precise, and considerate organizers in the future. With that, I wanna thank all of our participants for being here and sharing valuable insights. And thank you to everyone who tuned in to learn more today. And a special thank you to Ariola, who you'll hear from next, who has been a thoughtful and gracious collaborator.
Thank you, Dia, for this introduction and for the welcoming words. I'm Ariel Apira, curator at the Verily Center, and on behalf of everyone here at the Center and at the New School, I want to thank you all for joining us, our speakers, our accessibility providers, and the teams behind the scenes or in the chat where you'll see them most active today. In the chat, you'll also find more information about today's program, including housekeeping notes, full speaker bios, relevant links, and each other, of course. Please use the chat function to post questions. And in the spirit of this teach-in, the chat is open for discussion, but we will not tolerate any hate speech or harassment of any kind. Our team will pass questions on to moderators and to speakers. We hope to address as many of them as possible within the two hours. And whatever we don't get to today, they will serve as questions and guidance for what we hope will be future programming following today's teach-in. A few words about today's program and format. It was our intention, as Dia said at the outset, uh, to learn about what is happening in Ukraine and how to be in solidarity with the Ukrainian people from an anti-colonial, anti-war, and international perspective. In the three weeks since the brutal invasion of Ukraine, we have seen indescribable violence, a growing refugee crisis. We've also seen a brave resistance and solidarity with Ukrainians across borders. These responses feel right, necessary, and almost insufficient, if uneven, as Dia has pointed out. As the war rages in Ukraine and the impact of Russian imperial aggression and power is felt in other parts of the world, it already has, prior to and leading up to this occupation of Ukraine, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and to bring it closer to home for me personally as an Albanian via Serbia and Kosovo. The speakers you'll hear from today will offer a range of perspectives and we hope it will be a good starting point for further learning, dialogue, and for building international solidarity with occupied peoples. We've invited Jessica Pisano to speak from, for, to, to speak to some of the context and history, and you'll hear from her first today before we turn the floor over to our Ukrainian guests and artists for an on-the-ground perspective. Nadine Farid Johnson will speak on behalf of Artists at Risk, an organization doing important work in support of Ukrainian artists and cultural workers. It was also important for us to include in this perspective um, the perspective and experiences of Africans and other people of color who have called Ukraine their home before this war and are facing racism as they try to escape into neighboring countries. We've invited, invited Chelsea West O'Harry to speak to that and the making of race in the region. In the second half of our program, we turn to international perspectives and we will hear from playwright Mohammed al Attar, who joins us from Beirut with a lens from Syria and their experience with Russian aggression. Regretfully, our speaker from Palestine could not join us, but we wanted to include that experience, the experience of Palestinians living under occup occupation, to this conversation about building and supporting international solidarity movements. Luba Cortes from Make the Road New York will further speak to this in highlighting the experience of global South migrants. Before I turn it over to Jessica, I want to point you to a working document, a reading list of sorts that we've put together in the last week as we've begun to inform ourselves and learn in the hope that we continue to add and to add to this document as a result of this teaching today and we'll share this with all of you and registered participants following it. At our academic home, the new school, whose history has a lot to teach, teach us about standing in solidarity with exiled scholars, scientists, and, and artists, there's a lot of activism by students, faculty, and staff, and I want to highlight a concert and fundraiser for Ukraine that was held last night. Lots more work remains to be done and this event is but one of many in the ways in which you can support and inform yourself about the war as it unfolds. Organizing this event has already been a learning and humbling experience for us as Dia mentioned, but we are gra grateful to be in community with our Ukrainian colleagues today. All of you who have joined us, you'll hear from Dia and me throughout the program, but now it is my pleasure to introduce Jessica Pisano, Associate Professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research in New York City. She's been writing about people and land in Ukraine and Russia for three decades. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you very much, Ariela, um, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm delighted to take part in this uh, special artistic operation. I've been asked to provide some context. So I'm going to do th three things in the next 15 minutes, and then we'll turn to questions. I want to say some names. Then I will speak to the current situation and recent history. And then I'd like to identify a few things that require care in our response to the situation. 
So regarding names, I want to uh, ensure that our discussion is uh, anchored in the experiences of people who in real time are um, undergoing uh, the war that Russia has chosen. These names are places where real people led real lives until two and a half weeks ago when the Russian Federation began an all out assault on a democratic country that has sought to live within its own state borders. There are more names to say of places, beloved places, than we can devote time to here. But I'd like to sit with a few of them. Kyiv, Kherson, Mariupol, Kharkiv, Chernihiv, Zhytomyr, Dnipro. Cities, smaller places that no one thought about in the rest of the world until recently. Borodyanka, Vilatserkva, Yepin, villages, Zhukovska, Terhatshi, this morning, Zolochiv. You are all aware that Russia has indiscriminately attacked civilians and civilian infrastructure. This means apartment buildings, village houses, kindergartens, daycare centers, schools, children's hospitals, water, gas, and electricity infrastructure, nuclear power plants, vans carrying humanitarian aid, and so much more. Ukrainians are documenting all of this. Russia also has attacked artistic, intellectual, and literary life. Just in the city of Kharkiv, which is itself a monument of modern architecture, the Philharmonic and the Opera and Ballet Theater have been bombed. The types of weapons that are being used in Ukraine by the Russian Federation are types of weapons that have been used before in Syria, in Chechnya. Some of them are prohibited by the Geneva Convention. Others are prohibited in most of the world. These include cluster bombs, which have been used on apartment buildings, and thermobaric weapons, which are second only to nuclear weapons in their force. I also, in addition to calling attention to the way in which the occupying army has um, destroyed civilian life or attempted to destroy civilian life in Ukraine, I do wanna call attention to another element um, that we should attend to as we try to imagine what to expect next. And that is how the Russian Federation is treating its own soldiers. Young men, boys, um, many of them conscripts, despite their Kremlin's comments, um, with a couple of months training, uh, who did not know where, where they were being sent, are not being evacuated from the battlefield when they are wounded, are being cremated, not buried, um, and uh, are being left behind by their government. Ukraine and Ukrainians are providing medical aid to those um, wounded soldiers who have invaded their country. I wanna say a few words about recent history to refresh your memory and to help us situate um, narratives that we are hearing and may hear about the situation. So we'll go just back to 2014. We could go back a lot further, uh, but for the purposes of time, let's focus on the last eight years since that is a phrase you will be hearing more and more from the Kremlin. In 2014, Ukrainians demonstrated against a corrupt president, Viktor Yanukovych, who, among other things, refused to sign an agreement with the European Union. In the face of demonstrations and violence against demonstrators, Yanukovych fled to Russia, provoking a constitutional crisis. Vladimir Putin, who had plans in place, seized the moment amidst this crisis, claiming discrimination against Russian speakers in the south and east of Ukraine, Russia seized Crimea and provoked and armed proxies in two primarily Russian-speaking regions of Ukraine, Lugansk and Donetsk. Ukraine has been fighting to keep its territory ever since. Putin, 
who has used protection of Russian speakers as a pretext for what has only what can only be described as an attempt to annihilate Ukrainian cities and villages is attacking both Russian speaking areas and the rest of the country. Some people like to say that Russian speakers in Ukraine are freer than Russian speakers in Russia. Two of the major sites of Russian aggression in the last two weeks have been the city of Mariupol and the city of Kharkiv. Most people in both of those cities speak mainly Russian. So this is the way in which um, this protection is being framed. Now, I'd like to call our attention to a few um, things of which we should beware as we speak about this. And as um, all of you think of ways to um, express your solidarity uh, and to respond to this situation. The first has to do with the language with which we speak about this. What is happening right now is a war. I don't know that there's any other way to describe it. Um, Russians are prohibited from using this word. And um, for the crime of uh, speaking about what is happening, there are automatic prison sentences of 15 years. Putin, in part, um, may be avoiding this word because there are implications for general mobilization if he declares war. And that is a mobilization that may result in a battle he will lose at home. This is a war, it is not a crisis. Although it soon will be for people all over the world who depend on Ukrainian grain for their daily bread. Fields where major industrial crops, wheat, sunflower normally are cultivated have been destroyed. This means that much of the world, including around the equator and in the Southern hemisphere, um, will not be able to buy grain in the coming at least two years, if not longer. So attend to our language as we speak about this. Second, I think at this point, we are all aware that this is not only a hot war, it's, hot war, it's an infor information war that narratives about what is happening in Ukraine um, are available in, on social media um, that um, promote the Kremlin's view of this. Um, these narratives uh, also under the previous American presidential administration um, came directly out of the White House. I would be happy to speak more about that if you wish. The way to navigate this information war is to educate ourselves as to what ideas and interpretations the Kremlin is promoting, and then to recognize them for what they are and where they come from. Sometimes re repetition of these discourses is deliberate and sometimes it may be accidental, but it's important that we know what those ideas are uh, so that we can um, understand and contextualize them and choose other language and choose uh, interpretations that are um, express fidelity to what is actually uh, un unfolding in Ukraine. Third, Putin has clearly indicated that he wants to make this a global war. He wants to make this a contest between Russia and the United States or Russia and the West over Ukraine. This approach attempts to rob Ukrainians of the agency that they more than any other nation have so clearly demonstrated. It's important not to take on board the Kremlin's discourse about this as a global conflict or to make this discourse our own. Stopping this war means stopping Russia's criminal war against Ukraine. This is not and has never been about NATO. The NATO line is the Kremlin's line. I'll stop there to, to answer any questions. Sabuna Ukraina. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I think you've laid out, I think, the, the, the terms and the stakes for, for the conversation that we're going to continue to have today and the weeks and, 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 and months to come. I think one immediate question that I do see in the chat that I think potentially people want to hear from more from you is to speak more to the previous administration's lies. 
Sure. So um, the first thing I would say about this is that it's important to understand the structure of elite um, political elite um, contact and transmission of information in order to understand how this is unfolding. I mentioned Viktor Yanukovych, with whom many of you are familiar, who fled Ukraine to Russia. Um, some of the people who advised Yanukovych in his political campaigns were also directly linked to the administration of the previous uh, American president. So, um, for example, Paul Manafort advised both Yanukovych and um, led the, the Trump campaign for a period of time. Um, so we know that there are uh, channels of communication. Also, if any of you care to read the full text of the Mueller report, uh, plenty is documented therein. Um, perhaps one thing we ought to attend to, because we are seeing um, other types of interpretations being um, promoted in American media at the moment um, by American politicians, um, is the fact that uh, if you recall the first impeachment proceeding um, against then President Trump, um, Trump's request to uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky to do us a favor though, if you recall, just to remind everyone, um, this was a withholding of uh, aid to Ukraine until Zelensky would promise at Trump's request to intervene in an American election by announcing an investigation of, uh, of President then candidate Biden's son. Zelensky did not uh, relent, but this is what was requested of him. Um, this and many other examples we could point to, including uh, the removal of support for Ukraine at Trump's request from the um, Republican platform in 2016, are part of a pattern of behavior on the part of uh, a section of the Republican Party, uh, which very clearly has aligned itself with uh, Putin and, uh, and against Ukraine. And that's what I would highlight there. Thank you. Um, just give me a moment. I think I'm trying to scroll through the uh, questions. I think one question is, can we discuss NATO? I think you point that this is not about NATO, but in what way do you see NATO's role? I think there has been also calls for NATO's involvement and sort of what's your um, take on that? Well, so NATO as a defensive alliance that has been used in other ways in the past um, is an important, um, organization for uh, the creation of unity in this situation, um, unity that the previous American administration did everything it could to weaken. Um, however, uh, I think it is important, especially for people who think of themselves, right, as, uh, as anti-imperial, right, anti-colonial, um, anti-war, to understand that um, the idea that Russia is attempting to destroy Ukraine um, because uh, of Western attempts to push NATO too close to its borders, um, uh, integrates the Kremlin's own uh, ideology and uh, propaganda about this. Um, NATO was already at Russia's borders um, several years ago. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the political change that resulted in Yanukovych's flight to Russia was over a relationship with the European Union, not a relationship with NATO. Um, and furthermore, um, it seems clear that whether or not, uh, you know, a sovereign state wants to join an international organization is, is up to that sovereign state. Um, so I, I would caution uh, against um, an overemphasis on this given the way in which the Kremlin has, has framed the issue. Um, and I would also encourage those who wish to understand it to you know, read, read Putin's speeches about Ukraine um, from uh, the last few weeks and then from last summer. Um, I think that gives you a much clearer idea of, um, of, of what's going on here. If, if I may ask, would you care to uh, to sort of speak a bit to some of those um because i think a lot has been talked about in the in the western media as well as other instances about his remarks um early on in terms of i think the framing um for for this invasion and i think for those of us who don't have a lot of insight into the history um mentions of stalin and lenin and things like that i think a lot of us were kind of like well hold on what are we talking about and i think it it is potentially relevant, I think, to this conversation to bring some of those historical contexts 
in because I think they are playing into particular um, contexts that we may not always be aware of. Sure. So, um, so one thing perhaps to be aware of is a bit more about linguistic identity and how this um, how this is related to the historical context. Um, we don't have time to speak in detail about the different ways in which um, the contemporary state of Ukraine uh, has, uh, you know, has come to include populations who, with different linguistic and cultural practices. Um, it is important for our audience to understand that the Ukrainian constitution provides for um, national belonging in a way that is very similar to the way Americans think about it, um, right? It's not about uh, national ethnic linguistic identity. Um, now, there are uh, large populations in Ukraine who speak Russian. Um, many of them uh, speak Russian because of a history of Soviet industrialization, which brought Russian speakers to certain parts of Ukraine um, in the post-war period uh, and, and earlier um, in, order to, um, in order to build industry and project Moscow's power. Um, now, uh, you know, Putin has made the argument uh, in um, the last, you know, couple of years, uh, and also <laughs> with much longer ago, that uh, that Russia and Ukraine are somehow right one people. Um, I struggle to reconcile uh, that perspective with um, what the Russian uh, ar army and armed forces are are doing in Ukraine right now. Um, the only way I arrive at some kind of interpretation is, is through a, a Russian uh, expression, uh, beat your own so that others will be afraid. Um, although Ukrainians are clearly not uh, their own, uh, even if Russia thinks that that's the case. Um, so so there's, there's a long and complicated history there. Um, However, I would not take, again, if you go and read Putin's speeches, these are not historical documents. There's, there's very little that is recognizable um, for historians in, in the narrative that he has, uh, that he has pr produced. But I would also add here, by way of recent history, that um, you know, the notion that Russia had designs on Ukraine and specifically on, um, on Kharkiv Skoblis and other parts of uh, the East in Ukraine, is not, it's not a new notion. Um, I happened to be living in Kharkiv when Putin came to power and uh, the very next day, uh, everyone was very clear that, um, that he was going to invade someday. Uh, and this was spoken about openly um, more than 20 years ago. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's a great deal that we could uh, that we could talk about. I encourage people to read um, any good um, sources you might want to point people. I mean, I think our reading list is just sure bad of, of information and 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 rather um, insufficient. I think for for anyone really looking to inform themselves. But if there's any books, I think again we are gathered also as part of a teaching and speak from an academic yes. perspective. So potentially there's some books that you would like to highlight. Absolutely. So I will just um, give a, a quick shout out to, um, for those who are interested in NATO and that question, um, an excellent article recently by New School um, people, Jan Dutkiewicz and Jan Smolensky uh, in the New Republic um, addresses this issue uh, very effectively. Um, I will be happy to provide some books uh, for the reading list um, on the history uh, following, following the discussion. Integrate, and we also ask you to put um, any suggestions and email us at blc um, at newschool.edu for any readings that we might want to add um, to the reading list, and we'll share that with participants um, later on. Let me see if there's any other questions before I pass it on to my colleagues. Um, and again, this is just an, an entry point, And I think there's lots that we could be talking about. But I think if we can close with this, um, Jessica, what would you say um, is the most immediate? Because I think there's lots of different ways in which we can um, respond and should be responding. But what is the most immediate way in which those of us who are gathered here in this room can show, show support? Um, I mean, I think you've pointed us that even just sort of our change of language and really sort of um, 
being um, mindful and, and taking care with that, but what are some other ways in which you think um, our immediate solidarity can be shown and, and really can be impactful at this moment? Um, in terms of practical response, um, the need is so great um, in every single direction that it's really hard for me to um, identify just one thing. Um, and and not there, there are needs not only in expression, but also in, in political action, right? Um, in order to support um, Ukrainians' effort to preserve their, their sovereignty. Um, I think that the, the first and most important step um, is to attend to, again, the language that we use. Um, I would be happy to provide you know, a vetted list of organizations to which people can donate and all of that um, after, after our talk. Um, but um, I think uh, educating ourselves um, about the, the different narratives that are floating around here is going to be extremely important. And then, um, I, I also maybe would would come back to to one come back to the point that there are clear clear explicit efforts, especially in the last number of days, on the part of um, certain members of the of the of the the Putin government um, to try to push this into a global conflict, which, as Vladimir Putin has himself uh, said, uh, in which there will be no. Um, victors. Um, and this is, of course, the dilemma in which uh, every government um, finds itself, because we are talking about uh, a, a war of, I guess, imperial expansion um, with nuclear weapons um, and with hostage nuclear power plants. Um, and so um, and so the political aspects of this are extremely difficult. So I think um, efforts to educate ourselves about uh, language discourse and also unity. Um, it is, I think, imperative that those who stand in solidarity with Ukrainians not end up fighting amongst themselves about why this is happening, um, uh, but instead um, do everything possible to support the non-combatants, including the, at this point, I think more than a million children who have had to uh, who have had to leave Ukraine, and to all of the brave people who are staying where they live and are living underground right now um, in some cities without water, without electricity, without heat in March in Ukraine, which is colder than New York by some measure. Um, so I think uh, education in the, in, the, in, the disc, in the narratives, identifying where they come from, um, Maintaining unity, maintaining unity, um, and understanding that this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint, and that um, this really needs not to be a conflict of the month club that the American uh, public and others wave flags about and then forget about, because this is going to um, be a, a, is going to be a challenge for people in Ukraine um, for for our lifetimes. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that important perspective. Um, I will turn it over to our colleague, Karina Apostol, who will be welcoming and introducing our two Ukrainian speakers who will really um, speak from, from the ground, as Jessica, you pointed out, living in various different cities, um, some in bunkers, and really trying to do their most um, on the ground. Karina, I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ariola. Um, can I begin now? Yes. Yes, please. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you. My name is Karina Apostol. I'm a curator, writer, and educator, um, a citizen of Romania, and uh, currently a resident of Estonia and Latvia and three countries that are bordering the current war waged by Putin's Russia against Ukraine. Um, for the past uh, over two weeks, I have witnessed from a distance while being um, in the vicinity the continuous violence unfolding against peaceful citizens in Ukraine. And as one who has survived through a bloody toppling of a ruthless authoritarian regime in Eastern Europe, it has been deeply disheartening to witness this loss of human life, not to mention the destruction of art, culture, and even entire cities. And I want to begin by thanking my dear colleagues and also friends, Larissa Babi and Mikola Ridnui, uh, who are two brilliant, brave, and dedicated artists who I've known for now several years and who I deeply admire for being with us this evening. 
Um, as expressed before, their voices are at the center of this discussion, so I don't wish to take out too much time express, except to express my full solidarity with the people living in Ukraine right now and all those affected by Putin's war and to condemn under in the strongest possible terms this unprovoked, unjustified violence by military forces against colleagues, friends and allies. And very grateful to Creative Time and Verily Center for organizing this event this evening. And also want to encourage everybody who is here not to remain silent in the face of these atrocities happening now in Ukraine and be supportive in any way that you can of the art and cultural community and all those bearing the brunt of this aggression. In these extremely challenging moments, I believe art should stand in opposition to the violent authoritarian powers in this world and should remain a terrain in which difficult questions and issues are spoken about where we in solidarity and respectfully share our opinions and worldviews in order to create a more inclusive present, a better present, and to pave the way to a progressive and emancipatory future. And with that, I would like to firstly introduce uh, Larissa Babi, who is a Ukrainian American translator, writer, and curator who dances and practices the uh, Felder, Feldenkrais method. Uh, she has lived in Kiev uh, for over 16 years and is now speaking to us from Lviv, uh, where she has been since February 2022. And also would like to add that uh, six years ago, I interviewed Larissa as an active participant of the Assembly for Culture in Ukraine that came into being after three months of continuous protest and civic actions in Kiev uh, and all over Ukraine during the 2014 Euromaidan. And uh, the next speaker this evening will be Mikola Rydny, uh, an artist, filmmaker, and essayist who is living and working um, in Kiev um, across media from site-specific installations and sculptures to photography and experimental films. Um, Mikola, since 2005, has uh, been a founding member of the Soska Group. I had a great pleasure of writing and uh, interviewing him for Art Margins many years ago. Uh, this is very important art collective, which has curated and organized a large number of art projects in Kharkiv. And since 2017, he is the co-editor of the online magazine Pro Story. And again, I thank you both for being here with us this evening under these very difficult circumstances. And now I would like to give the floor to um, Larissa for her intervention. Hello. Uh, thank you, Karina, for the kind introduction. And uh, I also wanted to say thank you very much to Jessica for the general setting the ground for tonight's discussion. I really appreciate it. I feel like uh, you said a lot of things that I agree with that I can't formulate being where I am right now. Uh, but I would like to share, hello from Dubuque, um, is that war is a very visceral thing. Um, even just hearing Karina introduce me in the present tense um, as a dancer and a Feldenkrais practitioner, that was really relevant three weeks ago and everything has changed dramatically. I was organizing a museum exhibition to open in Kyiv later this fall. Um, and now it's the 17th day of a, an intense escalation of a war that has been going on in Ukraine since 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea and eastern parts of this country. Um, so my entire person has been changed. For some reason, I would like to just share with you um, my day since this morning I went to sleep uh, around four o'clock last night because I've been spending my days um, volunteering with a small organization kind of just dealing with with everyday things like uh, people that are either close friends of mine or friends from 10 years ago calling me on the phone all of a sudden and saying that we have arrived in review this morning and can you find us a place to stay um, or can you direct me to some volunteer organizations in Warsaw because my family members just left the city of Lutsk this morning because it was um, bombed by Russian airstrikes yesterday um, and it suddenly become more unsafe to live there than it was say the day before. Um, this is what 
life is like. And I think every person here, whatever their talents are, whatever their inclinations, whatever their skills are, everything is being directed towards this fight of Ukrainians to defend their territory in a military way, to protect each other, um, our neighbors, our friends, our families, to get them to shelter or to help them shelter where they are right now if they can't or would prefer not to leave. Um, it is also an act of resistance to stay where you are, to stay in your country and keep living in your country um, despite the fact that a neighboring country is, um, I use the words, I've had to learn a whole new vocabulary to talk about weapons and airstrikes and, and the, the language of war. This is our reality right now. Um, let me look at my notes. So, I'm deeply grateful. Um, so many people have been reaching out from abroad to not only ask how I am personally, but to ask how they can help what we are doing. Um, and the thing that I, uh, would like to just keep sharing that a reality has, has changed. And there are people who want to talk about Ukraine because Ukraine is in the center of history and our words, um, again, to echo what Jessica already said, I also came into this discussion thinking a lot about the word solidarity and that it's not a word to be taken lightly. Solidarity is an event, it is an action. Um, and if you feel like you are in solidarity with Ukrainians right now, let that be an internal guide. Um, perhaps before it becomes an expression and your actions will show whether you're in solidarity with us or not. Um, because there has also been, this is also a frame of this discussion um, that, you know, kind of what can people with an anti, what can an anti-war position mean in this situation? Um, the anti-war position has basically been um, annihilated by the Russian state aggression. At this point, um, and Perhaps you saw on Monday this week, March 7th, I would like to share with you a most chilling quotation of the Russian foreign minister Lavrov, who said that the goal of Russia's special military operation is to stop any war that could take place on Ukrainian territory or that could start from there. So this current annihilation of Ukraine and its people and its culture is being done in the name of anti-war. And that's one more thing that we need to be very careful of is kind of bringing one's words and one's language back to one's body and visceral experience. Um, and because you in many, many, many parts of the world um, and I are in different places, I think the way for us to best connect is also for, through your questions, through your questions and your curiosity, um, I can guess I can only guess that it's really hard to get a sense of what's happening in Ukraine through media images. I actually have, you know, I read um, about the events happening around my country perhaps once or twice a day just to understand what's going on. 
I don't look at a lot of media photographs. I look at photographs that people standing beside me show me from their mobile phones. And otherwise there's just a lot happening um, on the ground. One of the things that I would like to share with you are some photographs that are not mine personally, but they're photographs taken by volunteers that I've been working with in the view over these past week or more. So this is a photograph taken in the main Duguid train station uh, within the past week. And Lviv being the Western Ukrainian city that is closest to the Polish border, um, some 60 or 64 kilometers from the Polish border, has become a huge hub uh, for refugees, people who have been forced to leave their cities of residence from all over the country many of whom are looking to go further west to Poland, uh, some to other European countries, but Poland is also on the verge of a humanitarian crisis right now because it's had an influx of some one to two million Ukrainians. Um, so on the one hand, this warmth and welcoming of the Polish citizens and the Polish state to uh, receive all of these refugees has also put it into a similar situation as much of Ukraine is where there are food shortages and huge um, crowds of people at, for example, the Warsaw train station that there's nowhere for them to go. They're just not fitting into other modes of transport to go further off. But this photograph is of the Lviv train station where people arrive and many will go to a refugee shelter to spend a night or a couple of nights to get their bearings. Some will try to stay in Lviv, um, but at the moment, Lviv is also quite full of people. It's almost impossible to find an apartment or even a hostel bed at this time. And many people are just getting onto buses or evacuation trains to go further to the Polish border immediately. So the organization that I'm working with called Community Self-Help is, um, helping people find, you know, with translation, not there are also a lot of foreigners that are still in Ukraine that have to leave the country um, and they need help orienting to get onto a train to move onwards. So this is the scene of a train station, which is usually a hall with people just milling around and now it's become a temporary makeshift shelter just packed with people lying on the floor. You can imagine whether it's stone floors or marble floors, I don't remember, but it's cold. Um, the place that has been the refugee headquarters that I was have been working with is a library that has been converted into a place for people to stay. You can see their beds set up in between the bookshelves. Um, people are drying their bedding. Um, usually people arrive in the evening or often in the middle of the night, they'll spend the night and in the morning um, they'll go to seek further place of shelter. Um, if we go back to the train station, it's also been an experience of learning. Um, you know, we have to figure out how to deal with the situation in real time. And so a lot of the chaos that was in the train station for the first several days, um, with time people have been figuring out ways to make things more streamlined. So now people who are waiting in line to get onto an evacuation train in Poland instead of waiting in a crowded underground tunnel for five or six hours um, without getting out of line so that they don't lose their place, now they're waiting outside of the station. There are volunteers um, setting, giving hot food, hot drinks, passing out water. Um, the other thing is I am but one person here uh, who's speaking to you from Ukraine and my colleague Nicola Didi will be speaking from Kyiv, but there are so many people like me. I have a lot of friends in Lviv who have also come from different cities who I hardly get to see because we are all involved in various kind of efforts to help in whatever way that we can. Um, the other thing that happens on a regular basis is the air raid sirens go off um, I realized I started telling you about my day and I didn't get much further than four o'clock in the morning, uh, five, five o'clock in the morning, the air raid sirens went off and I moved into the corridor of my apartment, um, and just stayed there until, um, the next siren gave a sign that we were able to go back to normal life. 
This happens on a regular basis. However, Lviv has not been hit by airstrikes directly and I'm very, very fortunate to be in this situation. Um, some, this is a photograph from a bomb shelter that some friends of mine, um, it's near their house and that's where they go to shelter when the air raid sirens go off. Um, perhaps I've been talking for a long time and it's time for me to listen to some of your questions. Share my screen. Someone can pause share if I do that. Stop share. You can also just stop share. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think now uh, maybe we'll switch to Mikola's uh, statement and then we will take questions from, from the audience. Mikola, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. Uh, hello everyone and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this um, conversation and uh, discussion. Uh, as uh, Corina said in her uh, introduction, uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> originally from Kharkiv, uh, the second large city in the country, which was recently uh, completely destroyed uh, because of the Russian aggression. And um, <clears throat> I lived there for 30 years of my life. and. Uh, uh, I was curating the um, artist run space in the city. And uh, so I, I lived through the, the big uh, uh, culture development in the city and the region, which is now uh, uh, under a big question. Uh, the, the whole um, fate, not only of the culture, but uh, also <clears throat> the fate of the society and the community in, in the city is just completely unclear. And the last five years, um, I was based in Kiev, uh, from where I was also need to move now because I'm also in Lviv as well as uh, Larissa. Um, I escaped on the second day of the war uh, because um, the rocket crashed <clears throat> just uh, 500 meters uh, from my house. So uh, I decided that it's not uh, safe anymore uh, to stay in the capital. Um, uh, as well as many of my friends, uh, they also moved to Kiev, uh, which, um, as Larissa said, became now a huge um, transit hub and the new home uh, for those who was need to um, leave, uh, uh, leave their place. Um, so we now um, we now observing a new reality and uh, maybe a new uh, historical uh, period, not only in Ukrainian but uh, in the world history. And uh, <clears throat> I would love to talk a little bit about such things as uh, political rhetorics used in this uh, war and uh, some aspects of uh, propaganda. Uh, first of all, uh, Russian propaganda, uh, of course. So what we need to understand is that uh, this war is something completely different uh, than what we had in 2014 uh, because uh, what was going on in 2014 uh, was um, mm, the strategy of a uh, hybrid war uh, used by uh, Putin and the Russian authorities um, to cover uh, their military actions with um, the actions of some kind of separatists or rebels on the east of Ukraine. So uh, this is why it's, I think, disappointed many people in the world, and especially uh, those people who are progressive, who are intellectuals, who are related to, uh, uh, let's say, leftist uh, uh, circles, because lots of things were 
not really clear uh, at that moment because some people saw that this is some fighters for uh, I don't know Russian language or uh, independence of uh, some parts of Ukraine of course all of that was just a political uh, manipulation and political uh, uh, strategy of Russia. What is happening now, uh, it, uh, this is completely different because this war is showing that uh, there are no rules in Russian policy anymore. And uh, this is open uh, aggression, open invasion, uh, which goal is uh, occupation of Ukraine or maybe uh, some big part of its territory. And what we are observing now that it's, uh, um, that it's, um, you know, I was, um, I was afraid to use uh, such a loud words uh, as a genocide uh, of a nation, but uh, what we are observing now in the cities like Kharkiv or the city of Mariupol, this is basically a genocide of Ukrainian people because um, uh, it's a big number of uh, victims among uh, not the Ukrainian army, but simple civilians. And what I think we also need to understand is that um, in relation to Russian propaganda or uh, political rhetorics that uh, to understand what they're trying to do, um, you need to project to it the opposite meaning, because what Putin, Putin did in the last years, uh, he created some sort of a new speak uh, described in George Orwell's uh, dystopia or some other novels and books. Uh, so uh, to understand what they want to do and what they're doing, uh, you just need to understand their words with the opposite meaning. Because um, I think that was uh, on one of the last meetings uh, between Putin and uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, uh, if I'm right, uh, when he said that what is happening uh, in Donbass region, the east of Ukraine, um, is a genocide of Russian people there, which is of course uh, uh, absolute bullshit. And uh, what is doing Russia now, this is a genocide. Uh, but we also need to understand that this war uh, is not the war only against Ukraine. Ukraine is the victim of this war, of course. Um, but I think that this is the war uh, against Europe and against the whole world. It's the war against certain values, uh, which is uh, freedom of speech and freedom of choice, uh, the freedom of individuals, but also freedom of uh, decisions, um, which are made on a, a governmental uh, level. And uh, how we should act in such situation, and how the international community should act, and what kind of support Ukraine uh, needs, I think is very important issue uh, to discuss because Ukraine needs uh, support on uh, very different <clears throat> levels. It's a military support. It's an economical support which is also means economical sanctions against Russia, which from my perspective are not enough at the moment. And uh, basically uh, the big problem of international support is that it's coming to Ukraine with a big delay. I think if those sanctions which were provided now when the war already started, if they would be provided in 2014, maybe all of this disaster would never happen. And I think our problem that is that we think about Putin and Russian government in uh, this kind of, in a frame of the democratic, uh, civilized uh, discourse, um, 
while th their system of logics and thinking is completely different. I, I think I was also very naive <clears throat> because uh, for me, uh, Putin and his decisions were more related to the very cynic uh, type of Eastern capitalism or uh, wild capitalism. I was thinking about the motivation of his decision, first of all, as motivation about um, cynical business. But now I... <clears throat> Now I can completely change my perspective, as I think many others did too, because we see and we observe that the, the normal logic is not um, applicable in this uh, in this situation, and um, I think Putin and Russian government they are thinking in the uh, epistemology of some sort of historical revenge or uh, some historical and political myth which is they created in in which they start to believe which means that this situation is very dangerous and it has no control and if ukraine will be not provided with enough of support in this war and Ukrainian people will, will be not provided with enough support. I think there are no end for this war. Uh, for this um, for this war, um, uh, if Putin will take Ukraine, uh, then for sure there will be next goals. Uh, in some of his speeches, he already pointed that. Uh, their goal is uh, to push uh, NATO back to the conditions of 1996, uh, which means that uh, it's also related to all the Baltic countries, it's related to Poland, uh, to Romania, and of course such countries like Moldova and um, Georgia. Uh, and what I would also like to say about possible support or solidarity um, of Russian people in, uh, living in Russia. Well, unfortunately, uh, I think we all read the news and we see these statistics, uh, where is uh, the percentage of the support of this war and the actions of Putin is more than 50% of population of Russia. And of course, all that voices which are against uh, this war is very important. But as I feel this, and because I also have a friends in Russia and uh, those who uh, disagree with the regime, but uh, the, um, the ways of their actions is very limited. There are really not so much which they can do and not to trap in the jail, as we know that it's even not uh, Russian people are even not allowed to call this war as war, but only uh, a military operation. So I think what can change this situation is the number, uh, a combination of things. It's uh, military support of Ukraine, it's economical sanctions, uh, but of course it's also a certain disagreement in the Russian political or business elites, which I believe sooner or later or later <clears throat> will happen. And in such situation, the civil protest of Russian people will be very important. But the crucial question is when it's going to be happened. Because as long as we're waiting for that, we don't know what will be left from Ukraine and how many Ukrainian people will die. Thank you so much, uh, Mikola, and uh, thank you, um, Larissa. Um, it's really nice to see you, although under these really um, tragic circumstances, and I want to thank you both for being with us um, this evening and sharing your, your experiences and what you have witnessed. Um, I will um, read um, a couple of questions. Um, 
the first question, um, we do not read much in the Western press about any organized reaction of the artistic, literary, cultural, and university communities in Ukraine. Perhaps survival and coping have to be the main concerns. Are there any organized communications we should hear or know about? Are there any dialogues taking place between Ukraine and Russian artists and intellectuals, knowing how perilous it is for any Russians to speak out? Well, uh, maybe I should respond. Uh, well, in last two weeks, um, well, I received, uh, you know, just a huge number of uh, letters of support uh, from very different people worldwide. And uh, a big number of them was also from uh, friends uh, from Russia with whom we did some projects together uh, in the past, because I think, at least for me, uh, when it became not really possible to do so much in Russia and in Russian institutions, that it was something like uh, 2012, so already uh, 10 years ago, uh, when censorship was provided and that space where you can say something uh, or criticize um, Russian political regime, um, that space start to be narrow and narrow. And uh, um, yeah, so basically um, the dialogue uh, which is exists, it's circulating only around um, the expression of support, uh, in some cases, even the expressions of uh, guilt um, from the Russian side. But I don't really see how ordinary Russian citizens can help us in this situation. So it's, uh, we are like Ukrainians are at the front line in, in, in this context. And yeah, Ukraine became a, a, batter, a battlefield so this is why this communication became complicated in this way. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add um, to this question about you know, organized reaction. Um, yes, it's true. It's really hard for there to be any kind of organized anything when people are literally fleeing. Um, I happen to flee Kyiv together with or three other artists, friends and colleagues of mine. And we actually did over the two days that we were traveling west um, piece by piece, not knowing what awaited us. Uh, we actually formulated an artist's statement that we wrote down once we arrived in the view. And interestingly, uh, we published it on Facebook, but there's been a lot of pushback from um, people that we've asked colleagues in the West to, to publish it officially, um, in part because it has very strong language um, describing Russia as a continuation of the concentration camp that was the USSR, in part because um, very openly calls a glory to Ukraine and death to our enemies. Um, and in this state of war right now, things are just much more sharpened. Um, Nicola mentioned genocide. And when I first heard someone say that about a week ago, I thought maybe it's too soon to talk about genocide. That's something that kind of historically you have to say after an event. Uh, today, I think differently. I think in the modern day genocide, it's not so much, it's hard to murder millions of people um, when the world is watching on Facebook and on media, but this destruction of the social fabrics and communities uh, that happened the minute that Russia started launching missiles into so many cities in Ukrainian territory that caused everyone to scatter. Um, you know, my life in Ukraine, why have I lived in Ukraine um, instead of you know, like what, what has kept me staying in Ukraine, even though I'm actually not a citizen of Ukraine, 
is these communities um, and these social bonds and connections. And in an instant, these people who are my people um, are all over the place. They're all over the country. Some of them are in Europe. And, you know, in, in to this day, families, you know, people are sending their women and children um, abroad to safety while the men stay to fight for Ukraine. And all of this rupturing is also a complete rupturing of our people. You know, a human being is not just flesh and bones that needs to eat and sleep somewhere in a warm place, but it is those connections and the bonds. And so that is something that this war that Russia has brought upon Ukraine, it, it is a destruction of the Ukrainian people, no matter what the number of casualties are. And so we do, we need to talk about things um, in these terms that sound extreme in kind of polite conversation. Uh, when people are in safety, there are ways that we can collaborate with people who are different than us. We you know, collaborate with our Russian artist colleagues or whatever. Um, but today, it, again, you know, when, um, there are ways that you can find a bond with someone in peacetime that in war, either you're for the same thing or you're for different things. And in that sense, um, sorry, one more thing I wanted to say about Russia um, as a state and Putin's Russia that people have already mentioned before, it is no longer possible there to speak out. And this war is also about that. Ukraine is this like threshold place where we are fighting with weapons and anti-tank missiles and anti-aircraft missiles and everything that we have in order for Ukraine not to become what Russia is today. For the Russian people, I'm not the one to say, is it too late or is it not too late? But we clearly do not need Russia to increase its borders. Thank you, Larissa. Um, I have a, a quick follow-up question. Somebody's asked uh, where they can read the statement that you just mentioned uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could paste it in the chat. Is that appropriate? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'll do that. And um, also maybe if we, I think we have time for one question for Mikola. Um, somebody observed that your view is interestingly different than Jessica's about thinking about, thinking of or speaking of it as a local war versus a global war. Uh, and they would like to hear more about this difference of advice about how we should frame this uh, in our own language. I just said that um... I just said that uh, maybe uh, Ukraine is not the final goal of Putin. So we became a victim of this war, but we also, um, Ukraine at the moment is a shell of uh, Europe uh, in this war, because I don't think that um, just Ukraine will be enough for him. Uh, you know, uh, now there is also lots of discussion about uh, the demand uh, of Ukrainian people and also uh, high-level Ukrainian politicians to close uh, the Ukrainian sky uh, because uh, the most destructive um, part of this war is uh, the using of missile attacks uh, by Russia. So um, the Western powers are afraid that uh, such a strong uh, gesture of um, support uh, could provoke uh, Putin to start um, a sort of world war or something like that. But I'm personally, uh, I'm a big supporter of this idea to close the sky because I don't see uh, the other way to save uh, people's lives. And uh, thinking in this uh, logic that we are going to prevent you know, something bigger, some bigger conflict. It's not possible uh, 
to prevent anything when you have a deal with a crazy dictator, he can cross these lines anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter how you act uh, against him. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question about, uh, for both of you, about the role art may play in the future. And this is also something that I'm wondering, understanding that it is close to impossible to imagine what the circumstances will be and that your focus is on um, survival. Um, something that I've been thinking about as we're faced with really um, situations that to my mind, for example, I'm sure for many people were completely unimaginable three weeks ago um, in seeing how many of the existing political structures and large scale alliances like NATO um, are struggling to kind of respond um, in a way that really can help Ukraine defend itself in that sense. Um, what artists are used to doing and well practiced in is thinking creatively and imaginatively. And it's that kind of thinking um, of different ways to deal with the situation that I think is really important. Maybe it's not so much about even you know, expressing or creating, but for example, um, I read not too long ago after NATO decided that as, a, as an organization, it was not going to make a, a no-fly zone over Ukraine, um, an individual person kind of thought out a step of how without NATO participation, you could set up um, anti-missile systems in a certain part of Ukraine. You could get airplanes from a particular country. You could get jet fighters who are experienced perhaps from another military to become Ukrainian citizens and man these systems. And that kind of thinking right now, that kind of thinking and quickly um, is perhaps um, a, a way that artists can really look at um, what's, what's happening and also thinking through, through your body and through your sensations and kind of being guided by that. It seems that existing systems are not functioning, they're not protecting us anymore. We need to think new ways quickly and immediately artists go. Uh, maybe I would also add a few words about culture and the role of culture these days. Um, so of course it's, I mean, at least for me, it's not really possible to thinking about, I don't know, the creation of some new artistic work or even filming. I really feel uncomfortable even with such an idea. Uh, and I think the role of art and culture completely changed because, um, for example, there is a, a Yermilov Center in Kharkiv. It's a center for contemporary art where I participated in a few shows and once curated a big group show. Um, and this space became a, a bomb shelter. Uh, when the war started. It was overcrowded with people living there for um, uh, for almost a week. Uh, a week, uh, And I think it was a really brave gesture, gesture of the director of this institution to organize this support. Um, also, I know the uh, artist run space here in Lviv, which is Dittenpula Gallery, uh, which is also serves uh, as a host uh, for uh, replaced people who came from other parts of um, uh, of Ukraine. And uh, I'm personally now uh, receive a lot of requests to, to show my films in different countries. And of course, I always uh, trying to negotiate that the costs from tickets and any kind of... Uh, money collected from that screenings will go to volunteer uh, initiatives and organizations helping people in Ukraine. Thank you both so much. And uh, I think we should wrap up on, on this note. Um, again, I'm very grateful to both of you for accepting the invitation. And um, uh, my thoughts are with, with both of you. And um, thank you for all your insights and everything that you are doing.
Thank you. I want to echo Karina's words of gratitude. Um, thank you so much to Mikola and Larissa for your insights, for being here with us. Um, I particularly appreciate your call to rethink the language that we use to question political rhetoric and how those logics are shifting. Um, I'm also wondering if you might know of any mutual aid work or volunteer organizations that you can drop in the chat where we can send money to directly without delay. Um, I think you have a captive audience here ready to, to do that. Um, so thank you again, and thank you to Karina for moderating. Um, up next, I'd like to welcome, um, I'd like to welcome Nadine Fareed Johnson, who serves as PEN America's Washington Director. Nadine will share on the important work of artists at risk connection right now. Thank you so much. And want to echo the thanks of, of everyone. It is such an honor to be here. Um, and to those of you who are on the ground in Ukraine, um, I cannot but offer just my wishes for, for your continued safety. And thank you again for being here. Um, as Dia noted, I am the Washington Director for PEN America, which is the literary and free expression organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the US and worldwide. I'm here representing the Artists at Risk Connection, which is a project of PEN America. ARC it, uh, safeguards the right to artistic freedom of expression and ensures that artists and cultural professionals everywhere can live and work without fear. ARC's ultimate goal is to address the needs of artists at risk and the organizations that serve them. It serves artists of all disciplines as well as cultural professionals using an inclusive definition of artist that encompasses those who work across any creative field or medium. Tell you a little bit about ARC's work, and I'll talk about what we're hearing on the ground in Ukraine. ARC assists persecuted artists by connecting them to its growing global network of resources. It facilitates cooperation among human rights and art organizations. It amplifies the stories and work of at risk artists, as well as raising visibility of the field of artistic freedom. And as I mentioned, it's a project of PEN America, and PEN is one of more than 100 centers worldwide that make up the PEN International Network. We do have a sister center in Penn, Ukraine. Right now, there are about 30 members on the ground in Kyiv. Some are additional ones are in Odessa. We have members currently in Kharkiv and some in Melitopol. Only three of our Penn, Ukraine members have left the country. They are staying to defend their land, to defend their culture. As Larissa noted earlier, this is truly an act of resistance to stay. Per our colleagues at ARC, we have also seen artists stay. We are in touch with cartoonists who are staying, who are drawing, publishing their work. We know that principal dancers from the National Opera of Ukraine, like other artists, have decided to join the Ukrainian Armed Forces. At the same time, other Ukrainian artists have found refuge abroad. On tour in France at the moment, uh, another, another great ballet company from Kyiv has found support and solidarity from authorities. And, and we understand that Kyiv City Ballet will be able to be in residence in Paris for as long as needed. And of course, there are artists seeking assistance both inside Ukraine and as they make the very difficult decision to leave. ARC is also hearing from dozens of artists requesting assistance. A week ago, ARC organized a coordination meeting with 15 US-based organizations and Ukrainian artists living in exile to provide quick and adequate assistance to Ukrainian artists and will be hosting a weekly coordination meeting with US and international partners in the fields of arts and culture and human rights. I'm happy to put information in the chat about that if you are interested in joining and or supporting. ARC also uh, in issued, excuse me, a joint oral statement at the Human Rights Council during the interactive dialogue this week, where we stress the importance of having artists recognized as particularly at-risk groups in times of war and crisis. Here, I will note that there are also regional artists who are seeking assistance from ARC, many Russian and Belarusian artists who are being targeted by their governments for their opposition to the invasion. I want to highlight now a number of ways that we can support Ukrainian artists. And the first is we can provide emergency funds for immediate needs. Uh, we would like to save artists and writers in the region to cover their basic needs with a focus on Ukrainian artists. More broadly, Ukrainian artists need to know that the world supports them. So videos of solidarity, publication of Ukrainian authors, artists in foreign media, et cetera. When 
people want to relocate, they need support with their visa process. It's just very pragmatic um, a, a support we can provide. Relatives and friends who are based in the United States can apply for humanitarian parole on behalf of Ukrainian citizens trying to get into the US. I will note here that there is a massive backlog of applicants for this process right now. Protective measures for, for Ukrainian international students in the US are also being discussed, which would provide special relief to students. If you are in the US, you can write to your representatives to seek their support for these and similar measures. When people manage to relocate, they need support to continue work, working in their cultural field. They need residencies, they need fellowships. United States-based art institutions and residencies should open spots to host Ukrainian artists. I also want to point a little bit uh, to the fact of Ukrainian culture and the effort by Russian forces to destroy that culture. It is something that museums and other cultural institutions um, who are otherwise protected under humanitarian law have been affected as we know. The museum community is mobilizing to help colleagues in Ukraine and individuals can also help in this vein by buying Ukrainian art. And finally, I would like to note that there are a few resources listed in the chat in terms of reputable independent sources. One way that we all can help is to recognize the disinformation that is being shared about this about this invasion, about this war that is being raised on Ukraine. So keeping informed via reputable independent sources is one way to be of assistance as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you Nadine for that explanation. Um, I'm sure more chat questions will come up in the chat and if you would, just drop in links to places that you reference to donate to, that would be fantastic. Um, we're gonna keep it moving. We have a packed program today continuing. Um, and just thank you again, Nadine, for your time and for your work. Uh, before we continue to the next presentation, we're sharing a link to an open letter written by Dmitry Volensky, one of the artists from Russia involved in efforts against, Ukraine, uh, against Russia's war in Ukraine, who is invited to participate in today's teaching as a translator for artist Daria Serenko. At the request of their Ukrainian colleagues, Dmitry and Daria decided to see the floor to uh, the Ukrainian artists present with us. We just wanna invite you to read the full letter um, and are leaving it in the chat for you. They're also donating their honoraria to their Ukrainian colleagues present today. Um, and now we want to welcome Chelsea West O'Hara, Assistant Professor of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, who will speak to us about anti-Blackness at the border and the racialization of the war. Hi, Chelsea, welcome. Hi, um, I'll say good morning. Good, it's morning for me. Good afternoon and good evening um, to everyone. Um, I want to thank all of those um, involved in planning this uh, very much needed teaching and opportunity um, to be able to dialogue uh, in this moment of urgency. Thank you for um, allowing me, inviting me to participate. I especially want to thank Ariola and Dia um, for um, inviting me and uh, working with me to participate today. Um, I also want to say thank you to the other uh, presenters. It's been an honor thus far to um, be able to um, hear from you and learn from you. Um, and I hope for the continued safety and care for those of you presenting from Ukraine and for all Ukrainians. Um, I also, um, as Jessica Bisato said at the beginning, um, that this is a war. I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, and as she noted, Putin wants this to become a global war. And so as we speak today about Ukraine and situate this um, war in a broader global context, I also want to uh, continue for us to speak and think about Syria, about Palestine, about Kosovo, about Poland, and many other places um, as we talk today. I also state that because I'm a scholar of race and racialization broadly. Um, my work has focused on the region known as Eastern Europe um, as conceived and interpreted in many ways. Um, and in particular, I look at race and how notions such as whiteness and blackness are created and recreated. 
And I also want to say, I'm keeping an eye on the time. I only have 10 minutes and now I'm probably down to eight. Um, and this is a very complex subject. And so I'm going to address five key points and questions today, but know that um, there's no way to have this entire conversation um, within the time allotted. Um, and so I hope for continued conversation and learning. Um, and, and as well, I'm open to further dialogue. Um, so with that, I want to say um, that um, the first question that I've been asked and, and I think about a lot is that in regards to this war and to the invasion, what does it have to do with race? And so first I want to define and situate race as a social political construct thought to have biological implications, but it does not. Um, and so race has its origins in Europe, even though today it's very trendy to think about race as something that's American um, or maybe South African, right? But we're, we think about 17th and 18th century um, early pseudoscience racial thought and scientific racism. This emanates um, particularly from Europe, particularly places like Germany. And so you have um, scientists like Carl Linnaeus and, um, and, and Blumenbach who are trying to create a type of zoological understanding of humanness and race is situated as a hierarchical construct. And so that's really important to know because today we talk a lot about race and power and power is key, but so is hierarchy. And that hierarchical construct situated people racialized as white, also at times Caucasian, right? So that's uh, the term Caucasian is one that was uh, created by Johann Blumenbach. Um, and so situated white people at the top and then those racialized as black people as Negroid, which was the original term, right? Did Caucasoid and Negroid at the bottom. And so that's really key because if we're gonna talk about white supremacy today and anti-blackness, it's good to, it's important for us to know that this was alone, I'm sorry, this was uh, theorized along an idea of a racial hierarchy. So that was um, an idea that began to emanate from Europe and then spread widely. And so this is really key for us to know how we talk about race in this moment today. It's also important to know that race is not and has never been fixed. So even though these ideas were thought to be based in something biological, right, that there was a type of uh, human, uh, like degrees and levels of humanness, that's how race was initially understood. Um, in fact, though, the boundaries of race have changed over time. And we can look to many examples throughout the world of how this has happened, right? Um, for those of you who are based in the US or based um, throughout Europe, you are maybe even be more intimately familiar with these boundaries of race. And so that's a lot has to do with what we're talking about today, because Ukrainians um, have shifted in and out of different boundaries of racial belonging. And in my area of expertise, I do work in Albania and Kosovo, and this is exactly what I write about, about this category of white and how people have been situated in and outside of whiteness, along the margins of whiteness and race. And so for many Ukrainians, for example, it might even feel foreign to hear Ukrainians talked about as white because for so long, those based in Eastern Europe, those based in the former Soviet Union um, have not had felt like they're on the outside of a type of white European belonging, right? And so for me, it's really key too to talk about race and belonging together because this is not, you know, so we, we know that race as a biological category of understanding um, does not hold weight, right? But race is still very real as a social political construct. And so it's important to think about the implications that has for how people are racialized. That's also really important for this particular war because that, that hierarchy, right? Those hierarchical understandings of race are what's, shape, are what's shaping what happens at borders. And so this is not an American or Western framework that we're inputting, but rather looking at how race emerges in very local ways. And so at the at various borders, at various crossings, what we're seeing is that there is a different attitude towards those racialized as white um, than those who are racialized as black, for example, or those who are racialized as, as outside of whiteness. So example would be Roma, right? In Albania, in the Albanian context, Roma are racialized as black. There's a term um, that, that is likened to blackness, but in other spaces, Roma across Europe are racialized outside of whiteness, but it may not be fixed, right? It's not necessarily along an idea of blackness. But what's really key is that the boundaries of racial belonging, the boundaries of Europeanness are really, um, are really taking shape at these geopolitical borders, right? So we have the borders of belonging and then we have the borders of nation 
African states, the borders of the European Union. And so this is really key, right? Because again, racialization affects everyone, right? It's not just that non-white people are racialized, everyone's racialized. And so we have to think about how that racialization happens and how groups of people are racialized, like what results from that. And so just make sure I have a couple of notes because I'm sure I want to hit all five of my points. This is not about animus. This is not about an individual dislike. Uh, for, so, so often the narrative and the understanding, a very um, common understanding of race, a common discourse is around hatred. And yes, I, there is room, there is space. Um, and I can talk further in Q&A about hatred. I'm actually teaching a course this fall about hatred. Um, but what, what we're talking about racialization and anti-Blackness and white supremacy, this is not focusing on individual individual um, you know, racial animus per se, but rather thinking about how race is operating at a structural level and how groups are differently impacted. And so when we see African students struggling to either flee Ukraine or to get into the EU um, because of how their citizenship is or isn't recognized, because we see Ukrainian Roma who have not had access to the same processes of establishing citizenship and therefore are not welcomed or not allowed to cross borders or are treated differently at borders and refugee camps. This is what we're talking about, some of these more systemic things around racialization. And when I say racialization, I'm talking about how race is understood, how racial categories are formed. Uh, and again, this is not fixed, right? This is always in process and this is always shaped socially and politically. And so we must remember that. I also too want to say that in understanding these things about race, it requires some rethinking and sometimes some unlearning because a lot of what we talk about broadly, we're talking about race and anti-Blackness now, we must understand that that's not necessarily how we were taught about race or how we experience race. And so it's key too to think about an always ongoing learning and unlearning when it comes to understanding race. Um, and along those lines, um, anti to, to discuss anti-Blackness and race, is not to sow any kind of division um, or it's not about preventing unity as it's often discussed. In fact, this is a way to unify, to unify against racism and colonialism in all their forms. So again, this is not about individual dislike. Um, it's really thinking about access. It's thinking about racial belonging and who is excluded, who is included, who is excluded, and how can we tear down those boundaries of inclusion? How can we have a more unified uh, realm, a uh, place for all to belong? That's really a key question. And so people will say to me too, well, why do you have to bring race into it? Like, well, race is already here. It's been here and it's all, it's always here. And so how do, how is it showing up is the better question, not necessarily is it here or why are you bringing it into this space? And that's a global understanding. Again, this is not about importing race as understood in the American context as much as it's asking how race, a very global um, you know, construct is, is emerging in local context. That's the key question. And so in this case too, um, we can talk about race and not necessarily destabilize the suffering. So we know what's going on with suffering, how Ukrainians are suffering, how there's multiple forms of suffering going on here. And so we can both address that and address within the context too, how racialization is differently impacting the ways that people are suffering in which ways. We can also have a very complex conversation about racialization, such that we hear in the news, right, that we've heard, uh, some of you have seen these very viral videos of news commentators saying, these people are almost like us. That's, a, that's what a Western uh, reporter said about Ukrainians. Um, these people are kind of in Europe. This is not Syria. This is not Iraq, right? So we need to ask what racial understandings, what racial logics are even shaping these kinds of comments, right? And at the same time, what is shaping a type of a warmer response? perception and uh, a legality in terms of who gets to cross which borders versus who doesn't and what does that mean on a global level. So these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking and understanding that anti-blackness and white supremacy, again, when I say those terms, I'm talking about the hierarchy, right? So I'm not talking about white supremacy in terms of white nationalist groups, though, yes, we can I can briefly address that in the q and I also do research on white nationalist organizations, but I'm talking about white supremacy in the initial understanding of whiteness as better than, 
as of more value, as of more worth. That was how whiteness was initially understood. And so if we fast forward here to 2022, how do, how do these same forms of white supremacy emerge today? And then the same forms of anti-Blackness, which again, it shapes all people collectively. You don't even need white people present to have anti-Blackness because again, if Blackness was situated at the bottom of the hierarchy, then there's a way that these social forms are shaped by the understanding of Black as the worst right and white as the best that was a, that's a very basic understanding of white supremacy and anti-blackness and so these uh this idea right has shaped a lot of the, the social forces that then mold our present day social landscape and so that's what we need to be able to interrogate critically um, and so my final point too is that the historical context really matters. Many people weren't even aware of the numbers of African and South Asian students, for example, who studied in Ukraine. And um, two people that I know who are doing great work around this are Nana Oseo Pare and Tom Lloyd. And they recently published a piece in the Washington Post detailing this history. And that history is really important too, because yes, for many, many years, the Soviet Union was home to many African students, for example, particularly Ghanaian students in Ukraine, who were able to study in the former Soviet Union and be able to um, be able to go on and have careers and, and experience a different kind of life than, let's say, for instance, Black folks in the U.S. at the same time. And so that history is really important, though, because it's a complex, it's a complicated history. It's not a very uh, singular one, but that history does tell us why there was even there is, is even a greater presence today, but then it really shows how the experiences of those students actually was not one that was completely anti-racist. It wasn't completely anti-imperialist. And so again, we have to we have to complicate a lot of these singular understandings and narratives um, to be able to situate what's going on today. Um, and that historical context is really key and really important. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm sure I'm over time. Thank you so much, uh, Chelsea. Um, I think there's a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll start with one is, can you speak a little bit to how racism is playing a part in Russia's narrative about the invasion? Um, I think I think it has also been pointed out that actually us in the West falling into this into this um, into this conversation about racism as well actually plays into Putin's hand. So if there, there's anything that you can add to that. Absolutely, yes. And so that's also a very complex uh, matter. And so uh, there's a couple things going on here. Uh, first of all, um, you know, as Putin's agenda is about, you know, um, sowing this kind of uh, discord, this kind of animus, it's actually to the advantage of Russia to, to see um, I, 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 to see like racism in multiple forms, because re especially under Putin, Russia has positioned itself um, as as like free of racial logics and racist thought, um, but but would be invested in seeing um, a type of disharmony, um, as as race is often thought of in terms of harmony and unity, right? As a way of sowing a type of um, of racism, and so we actually saw this play out quite a bit um, in the mid two thousand mid twenty tens. I forget which decades we're in, um, but particularly around Black Lives Matter, right? And um, as someone has already pointed out about this being a war of dis information as well, right? So we've seen a lot of this already happening quite a bit in the internet world of, of ways of, of uh, infiltration and, and kind of these broader questions about race and often putting that onto the West, right? These are problems of the West, these are problems of the US. And so a lot of that too initially is just like even the narrative around race in Russia. But what's also key too is, um, and I would say here we have a really interesting intersection of race, ethnicity, and nation, right? Because one of the ways that Putin has even justified this war is by saying that well there's an authentic authentic sorry an authentic Russianness to Ukraine, right? So really undermining the notion of what it means to be Ukrainian. And that is shaped by race, nation, and ethnicity, right? So these things aren't separate entities as we often understand them to be, but these are all interconnected. And so that too is being used to justify, along with language, right? So language representing nationhood. And so this is a bit of a way to justify 
But then also part of Putin's narrative has been, well, we're trying to denazify Ukraine. And so even with that kind of language, there's an idea of who Nazis are um, as tied to race. And so not only though is that um, is that notion a false one, but also there's a lot of um, immediate uh, you know, questioning of like, what does that even mean? It, it is complicated because yes, Ukraine and a, very, a small percentage of the population um, but also as a site, Ukraine has hosted white nationalists, right? But a lot of those white nationalists have been from Russia and Ukraine. And there is a kind of global white nationalism that surges that are here, currents of white nationalism, but that doesn't represent the majority of Ukraine. But also in doing so, Putin is erasing the fact that there's a very large Nazi and white nationalist population um, in, U in Russia, right? And then the, the likes of people like Dugan and others who are very active in these you know, imperialist white nationalist networks. So again, this is all really complicated, but that, but that narrative around racism is one that Russia has definitely pushed to both, to both uh, try to frame the rest of the world as having issues with race and to, uh, to erase and ignore the very racist elements of Russia. And then to some extent, I think also then vilify Ukrainians as the ones who have a race problem. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and so these issues at the border are, are actually kind of, of underscoring that, right? That like there's a race issue in Ukraine, um, but, not in Russia. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is. But, um, thank you so much for, for this important perspective. And again, um, I think you, you or someone in the chat put the article that you mentioned. Um, and again, I want to point that out to people because I think it highlights the history of black and brown people in the USSR, in the Soviet Union, and I think also some of the tensions that have um, arisen since then um, and why so many Africans are currently in the country um, and how to get how to get support to them. Um, thank you so much, Chelsea. Absolutely. I just wanted to note one more thing. So the European Roma Rights Center has been doing a lot of on the ground work and reporting about this and situation with Roma uh, people and also has many um, has, has connections. I've seen mostly social media, but they're connected to mutual aid organizations um, and people. So if people are looking to give or be more involved, um, that's so their website is errc.org, the European Roma Rights um, Center. And then also a colleague of mine, Kimberly St. Julian Vernon, um, has been reporting about what I'm reporting. She's been um, doing, she's a, a PhD student who works on Ukrainian and Russian history, but she's also been in contact with a lot of people on the ground. And so people wanna follow updates, especially at the border, especially about those who need help and resources at the border. Um, she is on um, Twitter at KS Varnon um, and, and you can follow her for a lot of updates. I wanna also say though that She's really overwhelmed. There's only a few people who've been covering the, these matters at the border too. Um, but I, but for some people, they always ask. Uh, they've been asking lately, how do you stay informed? And so mm -hmm. I want to share um, her page as a way too of just staying informed about the matter. Thank you so much. That's such an important resource. Um, by way of introducing our next speaker, I'd like to read something that I um, that he posted on Inst on his Facebook page a few days ago. The hardest thing to overcome, overcome when you're coming from a country that was left alone to be crushed by barbarism while witnessing a new war waged by the same barbarians is to contain your anger and frustration and to somehow find a way to invent hope. Syria has drained the hope out of me and left incurable wounds in my soul. I look at the brave Ukrainians today and with the Russians who are trying to resist the Kremlin maniac and I wish them a better destiny. It is our um, honor to have Muhammad al Attar join us from Beirut, a playwright, a Syrian playwright, um, who we hope to hear from a little bit about finding hope um, and finding hope together. Muhammad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for having me. And um, um, I will start, of course, by uh, sending um, my solidarity my and, uh, and uh, my best wishes for my fellow Ukrainians, those who were with us today, or also those who are actually under fire and trying to escape uh, unbearable situations. Uh, yeah. Um, today, I, I thought that um, trying to find links and comparisons between the Syrian context and the Ukrainian context would be um, um, something um, good to do, not just to, uh, uh, how to say, to, 
to speak about what's happened in Syria or actually what's still happening, comparing what's unfolding today in Ukraine. But us, actually, it's more about lessons that we always fail to learn. And hopefully, yeah, we can uh, yeah, learn this time or uh, things that uh, we can avoid um, yeah, in the near future. Allow me just to start my uh, presentation uh, by brief intro about the Syrian context. In March 2011, peaceful protests broke out in Syria against the dictator Bashar al-Assad. It's good to remind you that Assad dynasty is in power in Syria since uh, 1970, 1970. The uprising that started in Syria in March 2011 followed a series, uh, series sorry, of peaceful uprisings that swept the Arab world, starting from Tunis, Libya, Egypt, Bahrain and Yemen and elsewhere. The dreams of the young people who led these popular and grassroots revolutions that became known as the Arab Spring were similar. People simply wanted to overthrow authoritarian corrupted dictatorships in, the, uh, in these countries. Uh, uh, the demands were clear, freedom, dignity, and social justice. In Syria, Assad regime met the peaceful movement with a brutal crackdown. And for that, Assad employed uh, not just the police and the secret police and civ civilian militias, but also the army. After months of facing the regime horrible killing machine, protesters start to take up arms. And soon the peaceful movement will turn to an armed resistance and Syria will enter a phase of bloody war in which actually the regime found itself on the losing end despite the packing of Iran and its recruited militias. But Vladimir Putin stepped in in 2015, enabling Assad to stay in power at a tremendous cost of human lives and securing a foothold, foothold for Russian power in Syria and the region. In my talk, I will try to draw the comparisons between, some comparisons between Syria and Ukraine and highlight the links between the two contexts. My argument is probably more a reminder of how the world we are living in today is more connected than ever before and how complicity with barbarism in one place that we think is far from our borders will actually come to hunt us later. So what are the links between the Russian military intervention in Syria that started in 2015 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine today? I will try to sum up uh, that in four points, the political context, the military tactics, uh, the, the narrative and propaganda, and finally the refugees. I will start by the political context and the imp uh, imperial aspiration of Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was allowed to operate in Syria without any serious condemnations or any concrete threats of accountability or any even strong sanctions by the international community and the Western world. For all the well-documented war, well-documented war crimes that his army did in Syria, he met, he was met with nothing of that. What we have on ground now, as a result of this brutal invention, intervention, is that Russia managed to establish long-term political and military presence in Syria and the whole Levant area. So, beside the big military air base they have in north of Syria, they secured also Tartus ports on the Mediterranean Sea for the next. 50 years. Furthermore, Bashar al-Assad became under total control of Vladimir Putin. He's like, uh, for example, Ram uh, Ramadan Kadyrov in Chechnya or Lukashenko in Belarus. In Belarus, Belarus. A model of leaders that Putin would like to recreate in Ukraine, uh, apparently. In my opinion, the ease in which uh, Vladimir Putin was allowed to perpetrate his crimes in Syria, following, of course, Chechnya, Georgia, and Crimea, made him more confident that he can proceed on new fronts in his attempt to revive the Russian empire. In Syria, the world was in normalize, normalization mode with Putin's aggression. His, his crimes were met with the silence or even the complicity by the international community. Vladimir Putin briefly felt immune. Ukraine invasion was then next. The second point is the military tactics. Um, uh, 
Syrians tried countless times to warn the rest of the world that you can't allow such a big and advanced army like the Russian army, led by a man like Vladimir Putin, to turn Syria into to, uh, training ground for its arsenal. Uh, on May 25th, 2021, Vladimir Putin said, and I'm quoting here, all the commanders of all arms, air force and air defense armies, over 85% of the commanders of military formations have gained combat experience in Syria and now and are now relying on it in the course of maneuvers, command and staff drills and exercises. End of quote. He also said in another occasion, the use of armed forces uh, in the battlefield is a unique experience, a unique tool by which to improve our armed forces. He was, of course, referring to Syria. No amount of military exercises could compare with the use of force in combat conditions. End of quote. While his defense minister, Sergei uh, Shoi, uh, Shoigo, Shoigo, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, proudly revealed that the Russian army tested more than 300 20 types of various advanced weapons during the military operations. Of course, Syrian civilians would approve that along with their destroyed cities, hospitals, and schools. Today, unfortunately, we see signs of this aggression already applied in Ukraine, like bombing civilian areas, bombing a children hospital in Maripol, or the use of cluster bombs. I do hope, uh, though, that the brutality will, won't reach um, the same level that was applied in Syria since 2015. Where, uh, as known now, the Russian military tactics and from day one actually relied on targeting populated areas and conduct strikes and conducting strikes on critical civilian, civilian infrastructures, including hospitals, schools, water and energy infrastructure. The forcing sieges around cities like, for example, uh, Aleppo or the area of Eastern Ghouta and elsewhere, where, uh, where access to food, medicine, or other critical supplies was denied. The combination of the sieges and aerial bombardment then led to forced surrender. The third uh, point where I want to, grow, uh, to draw kind of uh, comparisons is the struggle over narrative. Uh, and the Russian propaganda. Like in Syria, Russian regime is relying heavily on fake facts and, and propaganda to justify the military aggression in Ukraine. In Syria, they were fighting terrorists, while in Ukraine, they are liberating the country from the new Nazis and the ultra-right wing nationalists. In Syria, there were no civilians casualties or no ordinary people who were uh, striving for freedom and better life. They were only terrorists and radical Islamists. Unfortunately for the Syrians, there was an already established pretext that Russians or actually anyone can actually use to kill them, which is the war in terror, the famous or the infamous war in terror. Under this slogan, killing is always more legitimate and victims are always worthless. As a result of that, the death of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Syrians passed almost unnoticed. The West and the civilized world is also interested in fighting those terrorists. So if the Russians are the one who killed them, then that is not a big deal. The Russian war propaganda uh, uh, was and still actually uh, uh, ruthless in dehumanizing Syrians and make their lives literally worthless. After being successful in doing this in Syria, it seems that the Russians are doing or adopting the same strategy in Ukraine. But this time, selling the new propaganda to the rest of the world, even to the Russian, Russian populations, uh, uh, fortunately, looks like more difficult task. Because simply this time there are no Islamist terrorists. Nevertheless, we cannot say that this current Russian uh, propaganda has no believers at all. Apparently there are the usual uh, tankies in the West and the usual groups who are obsessed with anti-US, anti-NATO narrative, and who, of course, only see one imperialism in this world. But more importantly, maybe there are uh, many in Russia who believe in what Mr. Uh, Mr. Putin says, and they are convinced that Russia is the victim that, uh, and it needs protection. Uh, it's the one that needs protection. 
uh, after one week of the start of the invasion in Ukraine, I had a phone call with a dear Ukraine friend who used to live in Moscow before leaving to the US two years ago. She told me that the most painful thing for her now is when she speaks with some of her friends back in Moscow and they deny the scale of the Russian aggression. Instead, actually, they describe what's happening as a necessary act of self-defense. My friend then went on to apologize to me for the indifference in which she met my frustration every time I spoke with her about the Russian regime brutality in Syria years ago when she was still based on Moscow. Back then in Moscow, we didn't know, she explained. The fourth and, and last point in this um, uh, brief comparison between the two contexts is the refugees and the narrative about the refugees. The Russian military campaign in Syria resulted, as, as, as is, is known now, in a massive destruction for complete neighborhoods and cities and towns. Emptying these areas and neighborhoods from their residents was a predetermined military strategy. We start, unfortunately, again, to see similar tactics in Ukraine. But because we need to learn from what happened in Syria, uh, then we should be careful not to fall into the same traps once again. For example, when we use the term humanitarian corridor or corridors to describe an action to allow civilians to escape the horrors of war and bombings, then we need to be aware that what is happening is a form of constructed displacement. Civilians have all the right to stay safe in their homes and city and not to be uh, forced to leave. This by no mean, of course, to say that civilians do not have the right to leave or to escape anytime, anywhere they decide to do so, but it's to prioritize protecting civilians in their homes and towns first and foremost. Millions were forced to leave their homes in Syria and no return seems possible for them anytime soon. This was a systematic war tactic that the Russian army adopted in Syria through carpet bombing and brutal siege. At the same time, the refugees' desperate attempt to reach a safe haven was unfortunately described in the West as a crisis, and it became known as a refugee crisis. This caused notable internal political changes in Europe and beyond in the form of the rise of right and far right wing across the continent, the Brexit, the normalization with, the hate, with hate speech and the calls to close borders and build new ones. What we see today in Ukraine in less than three weeks than the start of the Russian invasion, that there are more than two millions already left the country. I think personally that, I personally think that Mr. Putin is satisfied with that and consider it as part of his plan, hoping that a fatigue will sooner or later uh, replace the warm reception of the refugees that happening today. And the world crisis will prevail again when speaking about the refugees and their suffering. With this final point about the refugees, I want to finish my talk or my presentation with more personal note. In the past couple of weeks and during my random chats with different Syrian friends, I, I got the impression that uh, the biggest challenge we face today is how to show uh, a productive solidarity with our fellow Ukrainians without allowing bitterness, anger, and frustration to burden our actions or statements. Let's be clear. Yes, we are better because we saw how our death and, and, and uh, displacement, uh, how, uh, how, how cheap it was, and, and how the rest of the world didn't care much about it. And yes, we are angry because we tried to warn the world that you cannot ignore barbarism if it's not happening next to your door and think this won't have consequences. Later. And yes, we are frustrated when we witness the double standards in dealing with the suffering of the refugees based on where they come from or their religion or color of skin. However, more than anyone in this, in the, in this world, we do feel the pain that our fellow Ukrainians are going through now. Therefore, our solidarity with them is real and genuine. And therefore, we are again hoping to see a solidarity that is not designed based on geopolitical facts or color of skin, uh, 
uh, and therefore we call for a solidarity that is based on human rights and the values of dignity, equality, freedom, and social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for, for that great presentation um, and for that really important point about solid, solidarity, even witnessing what might be painful doubly in terms of an international response and also in terms of a great understanding of what Ukrainians must be feeling right now. It's hard and important to hold all of those together. We appreciate you being here with us. Thank you so much, Luba, and thank you so much, um, Mohammed, and to all of you. And I'm actually seeing some notes in the chat, really recognizing all of the amazing insight and contributions, and, and also in many ways, the wish for more time. I'd like to actually invite all of the speakers to kind of just come on. Um, I think there's a moment that we would like to kind of recognize you all together, give this opportunity for you to ask any questions of each other, um, and I think we'll kind of just go with that and see where that goes. Yeah, please come on in. Larissa, if, if I can ask you to, to, to echo the sentiment that you put in the chat, because I think it's really important to make that connection. And it was, I think, so much of the impetus for us bringing all of you together to really make um, some connections that haven't always been made or sort of missteps and, and failures along the way. And I think um, ways in which we have failed each other along um, the past few years in Syria and elsewhere. Um, so maybe Larissa, if you can start us off, but I'll open it up to questions um, that you might have for each other. I mean, I was very moved uh, listening to Mohammed speak. Um, but also moved in a place that I, it's gonna sit there for a while. It's hard to really put into words, um, but understanding my position as uh, an American citizen, as a resident of Ukraine in Europe, and very much um, not involved in what has been happening in Syria for the past decade. Um, and understanding that, so I've, I've heard this before from wiser people that like, if you don't realize kind of what's going on around you um, and you think you're kind of in your safe little house, it's then the war is going to come to you sooner or later anyways. Well, now I'm in it um, and I wasn't in it before. And um, I think I just, that's gotta percolate. Ugh, that's an ugly word. It's, it's, it's going to be with me. Um, so thank you, Mohammed, for being here and speaking in a way that is also very grounded and not hysterical and angry, although I can imagine that that's there too. Thank you, Larissa. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm muted. Uh, I think we may have uh, lost Mikita, um, but I just want to again um, express the deep appreciation um, for all of us at the Veritas Center in Creative Time India. Maybe we can get you back on here as well, because this has really been a truly collaborative effort for us all. And we, we are deeply appreciative of the time um, that you've all put into, into preparing for this program and joining us in such short notice. Um, and for the insights. And again, we hope that this is one, and it's been heartening to kind of see in the chat calls for a second or a third or more of these events. And we really will turn to you all, as well as all of you who've joined us uh, today in the chat with all of your wonderful insights and questions and resources to really think through what the next step would be. We're seeing requests to share the recording after the event, which we hadn't quite planned, we will um, consider that um, as, a as a further resource um, for, for those who couldn't be with us today. I just want to echo your, your thanks. Thank you so much to all of these 
all of you for presenting and sharing space with us today. This really was an opportunity to really learn together and consider consider a lot of very important firsthand experiences and perspectives. And I think Ariola and I have a lot to think about as to how we move forward with future events. We are not going anywhere. Our commitment is long-term and we really do appreciate you all.